thought that early in this semester I'd made some harsh comments about football. You remember that? And that just wasn't fair, was it? So what I thought I'd do to make it up is we'd, we're going to watch some highlights of the Super Bowl, about 12, 15 minutes, you know, the greatest action in the Super Bowl. What do you say? I'm lying. We're not going to do that. We're not going to watch football highlights. But even though I didn't watch the Super Bowl, someone uh, alerted me to a, I guess this happened, did, this clip, Michael Douglas narrating a short video about America. Was this at the beginning of the Super Bowl? Did anybody watch and know? Where did this come? Right before the Super Bowl. So for, I, did they play this in the stadium as well? Hard to know. Okay. So this was either something that viewers of the Super Bowl saw or <clears throat> something that was projected onto the big screen in uh, Dallas. Was the Super Bowl in Dallas this year, do I recall? Arlington. Arlington, Dallas. It's all one big mess. Who cares? <laughs> it's all one big metropolis in which I get lost. So I, I want to I play this clip as well and use it to sort of bring again one of the points we've been making into focus. So this is The Journey, Michael Douglas. At times, it is a struggle. We witness it. We feel it. We live it. But through it all, generation after generation, we never give up. How could we? Can you imagine what life would be like if they didn't persevere during an era that was far from great, if he never asked what we what can, do. can do for your country, if he didn't dream, I have a dream. if they did not show the world on our darkest day that our flag was still there. Tonight, here we are, united to see their journey. Two storied franchises. One founded by a shipping clerk at the Indian Packing Company. The other named after the proud steel mills that forged this great nation. Green Bay and Pittsburgh, where the game of football is in their blood. This is so much bigger than just a football game. These two teams have given us the chance for one night not only to dream, but to believe. This is a celebration of their journey, of our journey. Okay. You see what we're saying here? You got your American history and your struggle, which leads to your Super Bowl. You see what I'm saying? Was well, there any confusion about this? You start with your struggle, and then you end up with your Super Bowl, with the nachos and the hot dogs and the overpriced beer. You see, it's a direct line. Let me explain a couple things to you young people who don't understand. We're talking about a direct line from the struggle to the Super Bowl. All of the struggle was meant to give us the Super Bowl. Now, that's as plain as the nose in front of your face, quite frankly. If you can't see that, I don't know what the hell is going on with y'all. All right, permission to speak frankly and to use a common um, harsh term? I, I'm going to give you my opinion. This is total and utter bullshit. What is this? All right. On Tuesday, I, I talked about this long-standing debate between those who advocate a popular democracy and those who advocate a managerial democracy. Those who still think that democracy means the struggle to maximize participation. Those who think that the complexity of society has made that impossible and at best what we can do is devise a system of ratification by which people pick those folks who run the system based on their own values. But I also said that some people are arguing politics has moved into a 
a period of kind of consumption, <laughs> where politics is no different than the, the commodities we buy, or the entertainment in this case. And I thought this was a particularly striking example of that. Now, you've figured out by now I'm not a big football fan, but I don't hate football. I have nothing against football. It's a lovely game. My point is the way that the connection between a picture of America and part of the spectacle society is made so seamlessly. And I, don't get me wrong, that was a great video, yes? Very, very creative use of images, of music, of, of bits of history, you know? Very emotional. It really grabs you in places. Even though from the moment it started, I, you know, I had my kind of radar up about the manipulative nature of it, I, I can't help but be pulled into some of that myself. But is that a meaningful politics? Is that democracy? And again, I want to contrast the kind of what is often self-satisfied, almost smugness with which we approach these questions in the United States with the struggle for democracy and what that means in the streets in other places. So I want to, <coughs> excuse me, I want to uh, I want to crystallize this by, by introducing another term that you'll hear often in U.S. politics. American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is a term that has different meanings in different contexts. Uh, historians will talk about American exceptionalism, for instance, as they try to understand why the United States developed politically in a very different way than its most comparable nations around the world, mostly Western Europe. So, for instance, in the United States, we've never had a mass-based labor party. There's never been a political party in the United States, a mass party that had a labor base, whereas in Western Europe, all the industrial countries, Germany, Italy, uh, the UK, France, all have had what the historians would call mass-based labor parties. Why is America an exception to that historical trend? So in history, the, the term will be used in a, in a rather technical way to ask questions about why one society developed in a way different than others. But in popular discussions in the United States, American exceptionalism essentially means what the man with the sign. This is a picture I took from the newspaper uh, during debates around the State Board of Education's social studies curriculum standards in the state of Texas. There is a State Board of Education that sets standards by which the public school system implements curriculum. They do it around science. You often get a lot of controversy around how to teach evolution and around social studies where you get a lot of controversy about how to teach American history. And this gentleman was at one of those hearings and he was making the point America is exceptional, that we should teach our children that America is exceptional, much in the way that Michael Douglas was narrating in that video, <coughs> excuse me, a sort of American exceptionalism. So, how would we define American exceptionalism? This is one way to think about it. The United States alone has the right, whether by divine sanction or moral obligation, to bring civilization or democracy or liberty to the rest of the world. The assertion that the United States has a special place in the history of the world. As this writer says, sometimes that has a, a theological argument behind it. There's a divine mission. Other times people would say it's a secular moral obligation. You can hear both articulations of it. But the United States alone has this special role. That's a notion of American exceptionalism as it's used in popular political discourse today. Now, to finish off, a quote comes from Howard Zinn, famous critical historian, and there's one other phrase there at the end, by violence if necessary, that American exceptionalism <coughs> This obligation of the United States as a sort of beacon to the world is often backed up 
historian Howard Zinn says, by violence. So American exceptionalism can be framed in a positive sense, suggesting a special role for the United States in the history of the modern world, that special role continuing today as the, the man with the sign, or offered with a question, another conception of American exceptionalism that says, rather than see the United States as singularly capable of bringing these values to the world, that maybe there's a story underneath as well. If it's not clear, this is a cartoon that was published around Thanksgiving. You see the turkey? That tells you it's Thanksgiving, okay? So Thanksgiving, a holiday in the United States, almost universally celebrated, uh, around, I think, what we could call a kind of mythical version of the interaction between the early English colonists and indigenous people. And the point of the cartoon is quite clear that we're able to celebrate Thanksgiving with the big turkey because underneath it, our history is layered with the bones that are the product of that violence. So are we an exceptional society because of the democratic values that gave birth to the United States? Or from a darker perspective, are we an exceptional society because we've engaged in some of the most horrific campaigns of violence to create that nation. Which one is it? And what I want to suggest to you, and you will have your own opinions and develop your own opinions from here on out, what I want to suggest to you is that what we have to do is recognize that both things are true. The United States in the modern world was the first nation state organized around democratic principles. Now yes, those democratic principles did not apply to the entire population. Most obviously, people of African descent who were enslaved were not part of that democratic polity. Women were not. White men without property were not. Right? So the democratic values on which the nation was founded were not widely available to all, but still, I think it's wrong not to recognize that the United States was a break from the aristocratic traditions of Europe. States run in monarchy. That's not a trivial matter, that the United States created the first nation state with this written constitution that articulated core freedoms and a democratic representative government. That ain't trivia. It would be wrong to not highlight that. But I would argue it would also be long, wrong not to highlight the violence along with which the democratic principles came. There would have been no United States of America if not for the ongoing genocide of indigenous people. A campaign that, depending on how you run the numbers, most of this is estimates, exterminated somewhere between 95 and 99 percent of the indigenous population of this continent. So when Europeans came to the, what we now call the United States, there were people here. By the time the Europeans had settled the entire continent, Somewhere between 95 and 99 percent of those indigenous people were gone, dead. Right? Now, that's not a trivial point either. The fact that the, the land base of the United States would not exist if not for one of the most extens extensive genocides in recorded human history. Without that, there's no United States. That seems like a really important point. The United States propelled into the industrial world, in large part because of African slavery. Another genocidal campaign. Millions of people died in the rounding up of slaves in Africa, the Middle Passage, the, the crossing of the ocean, and through the horrors of life on plantations. Millions of bodies stacked up as a result of African slavery. Without African slavery, the cheap cotton that propelled the U.S. Industrial Revolution would not have been possible in the way it was. Without slavery, the hard currency earned from the shipping of that cotton abroad, the sale of that cotton, would not have been possible. And the capital that made the industrial explosion in the United States possible wouldn't have happened in the same way. That doesn't seem trivial either. So what we have to do 
is hold both of these things in our hands, this incredibly idealistic, democratic system and the reality of the horrors of it. Maybe it's the United States is exceptional in both senses. But that's the, the kind of complexity that I think <coughs> excuse me, we have to deal with. Right. Question, yeah. Okay, so the point is, the United States is not alone in campaigns of violence, even genocidal campaigns of violence. That's certainly true. But when a country makes a claim to be a unique expression of moral and political values, it is implicitly holding itself to a different standard. And of course, the, the fact that one individual or organization commits crimes, let's say, and the fact that others do as well is not a justification for the first. If, if I were to engage in the buying and selling of grades, like I said, for 10 bucks I'll give you an A. Okay? And if I were exposed to someone trading in grades for money, and I said, well, you know, at least I make the price reasonable. It's only 10 bucks. I know a guy in, in the geology department, he sells A's for 20 bucks. Does that, is, you know, is that a justification for my cut rate grade selling? No, of course not. Okay. So we do want to look at the world and recognize that violence, domination, greed, all of that is part of the human condition, at least in the modern era, in the last eight, 10,000 years. You might even argue that human societies have been defined by that in the last eight, 10,000 years. But that shouldn't stop, from my point of view, the critical self-reflection that makes us, at least makes it possible for us to become a more democratic nation, a, a, a nation state that acts in ways that are more in line with our principles. If we're going to get better at it, we not only have to articulate the principles, it strikes me, we have to deal with the history and the contemporary practices that make it possible for us then to move forward. <coughs> All right.